and welcome to A Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. It is no accident that you're here today, friends, so please don't run off quite yet. Please stick around for a bit and let's see what the Lord has for us today. I am so thankful that you're here, and welcome back to all you regular listeners. I'm so thankful that you are here. I love being on this journey with you. I love thinking about God's Word each day with you, and um, it just brings me such joy to be able to share with you what I'm learning as I spend time in God's Word each day. Uh, Please know that I love to hear from you, so if you feel so led, send me a message sometime and let me know what the Lord's doing in your life as you're spending more time in His Word. There's two ways to uh, contact me through the show notes. You can find a little link where it'll send me just a quick message, and then there's my email. It's a word for this day at gmail.com. Uh, know that I pray for you daily. I continue to pray that the Lord would draw you closer to him and give you more of a desire to know him and to know his word and that you will be intentional about spending time with him, that you will um, schedule that time. Be very deliberate about it, friends. It makes such a difference. Um, We should want to know the one who has done everything for us. Uh, I'm just so... uh, I'm so reminded every day that the more that we spend our time focusing on him, focusing our heart and our mind on him, he transforms us. You know, I've um, I've told you recently that my Bible study sisters and I are in Philippians, and that letter to the Philippians talks so much about our mind and our attitude and how we think. And it matters about the things that we think on. And so we need to be thinking on the truth that is in God's Word. And it will just make all the difference. It's transforming, friends. You know, when Jesus was praying back to the Father in one of the one of his prayers that was recorded in John's Gospel, he said, Sanctify them in your truth, for your word is truth. And that That word sanctify is just a big churchy word that means to set apart, to make holy. Um, And friends, that is how he, that is one of the ways that he sets us apart, that he transforms us into who he wants us to be as if we are spending time in his word. So it is something that we cannot neglect. We cannot take it lightly. It's a, it's serious business. And so I want to encourage you in that. I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you didn't do it much yesterday. Purpose, you're going to do it more today than you did yesterday. Right. If, uh, if all you have time to do is uh, write a Bible verse on a post-it note and stick it on your desk, stick it on your refrigerator, stick it on your bathroom mirror, uh, stick it in your car so there's something that you can just be looking at over and over again and then have that Bible study time, have the just reading his word, have that time of prayer, have that time of worship. Friends, it makes a difference and you do have time to do that through the day. You probably can't do it all in one sitting, but you can do little snippets throughout the day and it it will be such a blessing to you now will it be easy no because that old devil's going to come after you and try to distract you and try to tell you that you're too busy or that you don't need to waste your time doing that or who would want to study an old book or you might want to read the latest greatest and you can't see my air quotes here um christian book no We need God's Word. Everything we need is in God's Word. So I want to encourage you in that today. Um, Please uh, consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone who you think may receive a blessing from it. Well, our verse for the day for September the 2nd, 2024, comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 2, and it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. It is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice, and then for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. 
So what is that fate that is talked about here? I think you could probably imagine what the writer of the Ecclesiastes was talking about. But we're going to park here. We're going to, uh, with God's help, read the verses surrounding this so that we can get the appropriate context and see what Solomon, who was the writer, was talking about. You know, um, if you've been on this journey with me for very long, this is the time that I think it's wise for us to think about where we are in the scripture, uh, what book or letter we're in, who may have written it, what was going on, what was the theme, if we can ascertain that. And that helps us to remember, to recall, to share it, to apply it. And so we're in the Old Testament again. We are in the section of scripture that is sometimes referred to as the wisdom and poetry literature. The Old Testament begins with the books of the law. Then it moves into Old Testament history. We talked about that a lot the last few days. And then it goes from there into this wisdom and poetry literature. And then it moves into the major prophets and the minor prophets. And it's a very straightforward way, much like the New Testament is set up in a very straightforward way. Uh, but it has helped me to think about that so that when I get ready to go look something up, I can say, okay, this is relatively roughly in this part of the, of the scripture. It wasn't just willy-nilly or haphazard the way this was put together. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was definite... Uh, planning and thought that went into it, and I believe that that was in it was uh, God and Holy Spirit inspired. Um, so we're in this section, sometimes known as, like I said, the wisdom and poetry literature. This book of Ecclesiastes was written by uh, the King Solomon, and we know that because at the beginning of Ecclesiastes it says, "The words of the preacher." the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And he starts out, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And I've told you before when we've been in this book of Ecclesiastes that um, when you first read through it, it um, it has a very much what I have, what feels like to me, an e or tone, and I don't know if you know if you're not in this country, uh, or if you've never watched Winnie the Pooh or read about Winnie the Pooh, a, a children's cartoon, children's book. Uh, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about with e or, but if you do know what I'm talking about, e or was this donkey, and he was just kind of oh, life is hard, and then you die kind of attitude, you know. Um, he seemed to have a hard time seeing the bright side of anything. And um, uh, almost you get that tone with uh, Solomon's writing here, but it, it really is a more serious than that. Uh, Solomon was just able to look with God's help because he'd been given great wisdom and make an adequate assessment of life as uh, for mankind. You know, it's hard. You can work hard and then you still die. Or you may be someone who doesn't work hard and you still die. You know, you can work hard for riches and then in the end there's not a lot that you have to show for it. Um, good and bad happens to everyone, whether they act good or bad. You know, it, it's just kind of that throughout. And uh, we know because uh, we've studied God's word that uh, the bad things, the hard things come because there's evil in this world. We are in a fallen world. The world is sinful. We are sinful. And uh, we miss the mark. And that not only affects our lives, but it affects the lives of others. And um, when we think about uh, this book, it sometimes you think, well, gracious, why, why do we want to read this that is not very encouraging or very uplifting? But the thing is, it gives us, an, like I said, an accurate assessment of things. Um, but I love what Solomon's conclusion is toward the end of Ecclesiastes, and this is what he realized. Um, in chapter 12, verse 10, it says, The preacher sought to find delightful words and words of truth written uprightly. The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd, 
But in addition to this, my son, be warned, the making of many books is endless and much devotion to books is wearying to the flesh. The end of the matter, all that has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, because this is the end of the matter for all mankind. For God will bring every work to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil." And that is, I love that after Solomon looked at everything, that was the conclusion he came to. Yes, you can read many books. You can try to become very wise. And there, it's endless, the books that people will make. Some will, and we see this a lot today, will make books full of things that are not true. We have God's word, which is truth. And so we can focus on that. But the reason that we can focus on that and should focus on that is because because it helps us to know God more, to fear him, to follow him. That is our duty, to um, worship him, to be in submission to him, to realize that he is the one true living God, holy above all. In whatever circumstance we find ourselves, he is faithful, he is sovereign. And uh, I think Solomon, after he had walked through this uh, this journey, uh, this exercise of, of looking at all these different angles of life, that's what he came up with, and that's such a blessing. And that's what I think about when I think about Ecclesiastes, in addition to it just starting out and sounding like it's an ER book, the ultimate thing is our whole duty is to have that holy reverence for God and to look to Him um, because He made us. He's our Creator, and, you know, He does want what's best for us. And so I'm so thankful that we can uh, look at that and think about that. Now, Solomon was the author of this, and we've talked about Solomon before. We read in 1 Kings that he was asked by God directly what God should give him. You remember Solomon was David's son, and we talked about him when he was dedicating the temple just in the last few days ago and dedicating uh the that the new temple that he'd built and the utensils and all those things back to God and how he'd prayed to God and uh, God asked him before that in First Kings before that part that we'd been in what he should give him and so this is what Solomon said in First Kings chapter three verse six it says then Solomon said you have shown great love and kindness to your slave David my father according to how he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart towards you and you have kept for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So now, O Yahweh, my God, you have made your slave king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your slave is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a numerous people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your slave a listening heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this glorious people of yours? And it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to listen to justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall anyone like you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. Now, if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. Then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. And then we read over in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse I believe it's beginning in verse 29, where it says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of understanding in his heart like the sand that is on the seashore. Had Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And um, we know that God had given him great wisdom. So when he set out to think on these things, 
and work through these things. Uh, it, God had given him that wisdom. And then I love that his ultimate conclusion is what we mentioned in that chapter 12, that the whole matter is you need to fear God and keep his commandments. Now, unfortunately, the sad thing about Solomon's life is that he, uh, when he was old, he his he did exactly what God told him not to do. And he had taken many foreign wives and they turned his heart away from God. And so that is a very sad thing. You know, God had given him such wonderful wisdom. And I don't know if it was that in that wisdom, he, he lost sight of the fact of who it came from, or he just really got his eyes off God. And because clearly he, he had walked in God's ways, but then he didn't. And then he, he suffered for that. And um, it's just such a sad story. But at the time that he wrote this, he was following God and he gives good counsel here. Um, and God would not have it in his word if we weren't supposed to follow it because all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. We know that Solomon also wrote uh, Proverbs, most of the Proverbs uh, that he wrote, Song of Solomon, and at least two of the Psalms. I believe it's Psalm 72 and 127. And so there's much that we have here uh, written by him. In this a book of Ecclesiastes, he opens up and begins to tell us kind of how he came about thinking through these things. And it says here in chapter 1, verse 12, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous endeavor which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. What is bent cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I spoke with my, within my heart, saying, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has seen an abundance of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and simple-minded folly. I came to know that this also is striving after wind, because in much wisdom there is much vexation, and whoever increases knowledge increases pain. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with gladness so that you shall see good things. And behold, it, it too was vanity. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of gladness, what does it do? I explored with my heart how to stimulate my body with wine while my heart was guiding me wisely and how to see simple-minded folly until I could see where th is this good for the sons of men and what they do under heaven the few days of their lives. I made my works great. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made for myself gardens and parks, and I planted in, in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made for myself pools of water from which to water a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of the sons of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes asked for, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any gladness, for my heart was glad because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor." Thus I turned to all my works which my hands had done and the labor which I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no advantage under the sun. I wanted you to hear, you know, at the very beginning of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who was very wealthy, who had this great wisdom, um, did things the way the world seemed to think things ought to be done, you know, and he gave himself everything his heart, he thought his heart desired, and realized that really, you know, it was just a striving after the wind. And so he, he talks about that all the way up um, to uh, our chapter that we find ourselves in today. But when you have a chance, go back and read that and you'll see that he, he really realizes it's not about the material things. It's not about the status. It's not about power. It is important to have wisdom, but it needs to be godly wisdom. <laughs>
And so I want to get right here at the end of chapter 8 and going into our verse um, in chapter 9. It says, uh, when I, in verse 16, When I gave my heart, and this is still Solomon talking, to know wisdom and to see the endeavor which has been done on the earth, even though one never sees sleep with his eyes day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot find out the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not find it out, and though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot find it out. In other words, you, we cannot know everything. God is the only one that can know that. And then here's the beginning of chapter nine. For I have given all this to my heart and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their service are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything may be before him. And then here's our verse. It is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. And I'm going to read right after. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. And so Solomon has come to this conclusion and said, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of life you live on this earth. Everyone has the same fate on this earth. Now, he did not know Jesus, of course, because Jesus came after. But if we stop here, this would just seem sad. And this is how a lot of non-believers and atheists and people of false religions, uh, this is the conclusion they come to. Because it doesn't matter if they've followed their religion and their rules, and then those who are evil, well, of course, all of us are sinners. We all, unless we have been saved by the Lord Jesus and uh, made new, we all have, um, you know, just that evil desire in our hearts. We all still have that battle of between the flesh and the spirit, even if we're believers, and we talked about that last month. But um, if that's all you think that you have, then there, there's no hope, it seems. Oh, but friends, we serve a God who is that God of hope. We serve a God who uh, gives joy and peace, and he has made a way for us to be made right with him. He's made a way for us to be cleansed from that evil. He's made a way for us to have life after death. That's why we talk about the resurrection. That's why we talk about eternal life. And see, this happened when Solomon was writing all of this. As I mentioned, he didn't know about Jesus because that was that was uh, part of God's plan that had not happened in this timeline of history yet, even though God had it planned all the way from the beginning, as we see uh, all the way back in Genesis 3.15. Um, but we don't have to, to seem hopeless like Solomon sounded here. You know, it's not that we die and then it's all over. We die, and if we're believers in Christ and we've accepted him as our Savior, then we go on to eternal life, and it's not because of anything of our own. It's not any good of ourselves. It's because of God's grace and his mercy and because we have put our faith and our hope and our trust in him. If we haven't believed in him or for people who haven't accepted that free gift of salvation, then they go on to that eternal uh, damnation, that eternal hell. And friends, you don't just burn up and then you're done. It's that weeping and gnashing of teeth and uh, torment. But praise be to God. Thanks be to God that he has made a way for us to know um, and to understand and to receive that gift of salvation. And friends, when we look at this uh, this list that uh, Solomon wrote, uh, there's one fate for the righteous and the wicked, for the good, for the clean and the unclean, for the man who offers sacrifice and the one who does not sacrifice, as the good man and so is the sinners, as the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. 
all of us until we have accepted the Lord Jesus and believed in him um, are in that group that is the the wicked, the unclean, the one who is not doing what they're supposed to do, the sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we accept the Lord Jesus, we're covered in his righteousness. And that is such a blessing. And we have that uh, eternal life, as I mentioned, to look forward to. We read in Hebrews 9, 27, that we know that it is appointed for men to die once. And after this comes judgment. I mean, that's, that's going to be the way for the majority of people. And the reason I say majority is we did read that um, Enoch walked with God and then he was not, so God took him away. Uh, we know that Elijah went up in the chariot of fire. Um, and then we know that there's a time when the church is going to be um, called away. Uh, but for the majority of us, and when I say about the church being called away and we read about how uh, the dead in Christ will rise first when Jesus gives that cry of command and and then uh, those who still remain will be caught up with him in the air. Uh, but all the rest, um, if we are not part of that uh, that snatching away, that rapturing of the church, and we haven't already died, um, we will experience that first death and then everyone will stand before the judgment the great white throne judgment it's just that those who have believed will be covered Uh, we will have our uh, our advocate there for us and we can say no I've believed I've been covered by the blood of Jesus and and I've been made right Um, not in anything of our own doing, but just because of him. And, uh, oh, friends, I pray that you have uh, settled your account, that all is well between you and the Father, that you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior. And then you don't have to worry about this fate that comes to all of us uh, because our our times are in his hands, friends. Um, He takes care of his children. He loves us so Uh, But we do have to stake our claim. We have to make that confession. Do you believe or do you or do you not? And I pray that you have all of that taken care of. Don't wait another minute if you have it, because we're not guaranteed another minute. We're certainly not guaranteed another breath, nor are we guaranteed tomorrow. Um, God is faithful. Don't forget it. Blessings to you, friends. Until next time.